computer. Okay. Leon, welcome to Wellington, all the way up from Invercargill. Looking forward to seeing you here. Uh, thank you. I'm going to say over to you, and one mindful breath is here waiting to hear what you have to say. Okay, well, good evening. So just by way of introduction, I'm Leon Frampton. I'm originally English, like so many people in New Zealand these days. Um, came over 14 years ago. Um, trained as a nurse while I was here, and I stayed down in Invercargill, um, which is where I trained. Um, got a, a wife and four children, three of whom have got uh, delightfully full of um, the snots at the moment. So having having fun at night with those guys. Um, I uh, I work in the prison at the moment, which is a very fertile ground for practice. I can tell you. Um, and uh, on my own personal practice started um, quite a while ago, um, about 25 years ago. And, uh, and that's been backwards and yo-yo backwards and forwards with it ever since. But it's, um, it's always been there for me. Um, <clears throat> so, um, well, thank you for uh, welcoming me to your group tonight. I've um, only met Pete and... Ramsey before, so it's nice to meet the rest of you. Um, really what I'm just going to do is just, just share an aspect of my practice with you. So, um, so just talking to you as a, as a friend, as a fellow practitioner. Um, but so one of the, that's one of the important lessons I've learned from my practice over all those years, which is sort of the link to the title of the um, talk, being uh, the, you know, why I want to be a loser isn't something we're quite used to in our in our sort of Western culture of um, being a winner. Um, so, you know, I just like to put a wee caveat on, on this. It's not a sort of a complete presentation of a set of ideas or um, Buddhist principles or anything like that. It's really, it really is just uh, me sharing some aspects of my practice with you, um, which I hope will be at least coherent um, and perhaps have some positive effects on your practice as well. Um, so saying I want to be a loser, um, not being kind of um, cute with words, if you like, it's um, a specific reference to a quote that you'll find all over the internet, um, which goes like this. The, the Buddha was asked, what have you gained from meditation? He replied, nothing. However, let me tell you what I have lost. Anger, anxiety, depression, insecurity, fear of old age and death. Uh, and I thought that was fabulous. So I tried to track, I tried to track down, um, you know, like the like the rest of the sutra that would be around it for more useful stuff. But it turns out that it's a it's a fake quote. <laughs> um, you know, sad but true. And it's a shame that it's not authentic. But to me, it doesn't, that doesn't make it worthless either. Um, I think it's caught on across the internet as a, as a, as a Buddha quote um, because it sounds like something that Buddha might have said. Um, one of those sort of iconoclastic challenges to the accepted ideas of his time. Um, anyway, back to me being a loser. Um, I think losing can be taken in a lot of what, different ways especially related to practice. Um, for example, losing uh, the judgmental mind, the opinionated mind, and so on. Um, so again, this is about introducing the notion of losing as a way to move forward. Um, but going, going back to the very beginning of my day, to the, um, you know, uh, my engagement with spiritual beings, um, I, I didn't always see myself as a loser. Uh, quite, uh, quite the opposite. In fact, I was a spiritual voyager, um, destined for great achievements, promised me by a, a whole range of um, faiths and traditions and sects, um, uh, and they, they they promised quite a lot. Um, and I practiced quite diligently, and never really found what they were promising me. Um, and of course. 
me having a naturally uh, skeptical and questioning mind, I never found that that was fully fully appeased which always felt like an Achilles heel for me and, and religious faith. But um, uh, for some reason, I preferred the skeptical mind and spirit, spiritual emptiness than um, consolation. So uh, at, at that point, I turned to science. And so this is back in the time um, that uh, Stephen Hawkins wrote uh, Brief History of Time. And I, I struggled to understand it, but I felt like he was onto something interesting nonetheless. Um, you know, to me, at the, at the time, with all the other books that came out that were on those lines, it seemed to establish um, a new church for the rational and sane. Um, as science advanced and those ideas developed, I started to feel like I was being asked to accept a great deal on faith, ultimately. Um, uh, it kind of occurred to me that science wasn't uh, trying to kill God or was killing God. It was, I thought it was more like trying to take over his job. Um, so at that juncture in my life, uh, I bought a book called uh, An Introduction to Buddhism. I, I don't know why. I, I was a big fan of secondhand bookshops. Maybe it was just out there in the window or something, but I thought it looked interesting couple of hundred pages, you know, lots of uh, colourful pictures with mandalas and um, gold-plated Buddhas and monks in various robes and guises. Um, on reading that, Jap um, the sort of Japanese Zen ideas sort of quite appealed to me. Um, so I, I got a book from that, An Introduction to Zen, which is, again, that's sort of like a Zen's greatest hits, quite all succinct ideas all the way through. Um, and one of those, one of the things I took from that was, of course, the, the four noble truths. Um, and before you say anything, Ramsey, yeah, I, I say that, you know, whether we talk about the four noble truths, um, or the four tasks, um, which they are probably better understood, I think, these days in that way. Um, I think, you know, but generally we're talking about the process of understanding, uh, the root causes of dukkha. Um, and I side with Stephen Batchelor there about not translating that word as suffering, just leaving it as dukkha. Um, I, I like, but I like the definition that people try to put around it in English um, that encompasses that slight uh, dis-ease you can experience even when you're having a good time. Um, that awareness of impermanence that seems to terrify the ego. And, um, and in understanding the root causes, um, we see that we create much of our own dukkha um, and ultimately if we're lucky we see the possibility of a life not conditioned by that which leads to the dukkha in namely the reactivity clinging grasping and aversion well, I quite like those words I think they're very powerful um, quite innately descriptive for those forces that are driving us uh, And of course, so related to that, of course, is the, um, the three powerful forces of greed, hatred, and delusion or ignorance. Um, in my early days of practice, I understood that the best way to get rid of those was to um, was to kind of squeeze them out, you know, not give them any space to grow in your mind. Um, it wasn't an entirely useless strategy, and there are practices you'll find um, one that's called like nurturing seeds, where you you know, you have that kind of mental image of replacing a bad seed with a good seed um, and nurturing that in your life and in your practice. Um, so when greed, hatred or ignorance arose in me, um, you know, or, or any of those sort of tendencies that go with those sort of three words, just try to be patient with it, sit with it, um, thinking it would just go go away one day as long as I kind of held my course quite steady. Um, and I, but over the years, and I've, you know, I mean, it's fairly long years too, it, it never went away. So I became disillusioned, um, not just with the, the, the practice of meditation, but a bit with um, sort of, you know, my sense of self as well, which I'm not going to get, definitely not getting into the sense of self tonight, you know, the self or not self business, but, you know, just 
as I felt in myself. I just, I just was becoming quite um, lost in that. So I wanted to be rid of greed and hatred and any of those kinds of things, but um, couldn't see a way to move forward. Um, you know, but there's another idea that kind of helped me get through that, which was you know how we, um, you know, we need to define our own paths through this. So you know the that idea that we're building a raft to cross to the other shore. That is, that's a real book quote as well, isn't it? Um, you know, it doesn't matter how long that takes, as long as you've travelled that path with sincerity. Um, so one of the big realisations from all that ruminating and those sort of dark days for me was um, I had to let go of the ideal um, of myself. So where you decide, you know, there's a goal, I want to be enlightened, and you paint a picture of what enlightenment means um, and how you get there, and then you start to see that that's perhaps not realistic. Um, so I let go of that, Im that image, and then I found a natural ease came into my practice through that process. I wasn't striving after anything anymore. Um, and, and through that process of letting go, so losing that, um, losing that image of an ideal, uh, I began to see a little more detail around the subtle and gross attachments and the grasping that I had to those ideas of perfection. And I, I mean, I don't know um, what books you guys read, but you know, it's, um, you find a lot of that these days. Say, like with um, the ideas of Jason Seth, uh, talks quite a bit about that. Um, idea of you know attachments to ideals. So no, like so, lost that idea of striving for perfection. That was a really good. That was a really good um, step forward for me. Um, so when I lost the mental image of myself as a what do we call it as a sort of a, a shortlisted candidate for the ultimate prize of perfection um, of wisdom. Um, I began to see some of the roots of where that was coming from. So um, there's, there's, you know, there's Guy Arjan Sumedo, um, who wrote a book, I'm not sure if it's, uh, well, it's more like a collection of his essays. Um, uh, what's it called now? Sorry, well, that one will come. Oh, don't take your life personally. So he talks a lot about cultural conditioning and how much of that we're not aware of until we start to unpick it. Uh, so, you know, and, that, and that's not just a Buddhist idea, that's sort of common in um, sort of sociology or psychology. Um, so that's quite a quite an important thing. It's a, a big, it's a big talk and topic on its own. Um, so again, it's not something we'll go deep into. Um, but one of the big things with my culture, I felt as an Englishman, was that, it, you know, the culture pushes us to reject what we currently have, no matter how adequate it is for our needs. And we're encouraged to drive on to something more, something greater. And that's present in many parts of our life. Um, so when I lost that image of a perfect self, I start, started to also lose that image of a you know, perfect self within um, society. So I wasn't striving again for things for myself. Um, uh, an example, I mean, a simple example of that that you know might be common to you guys as well. Um, it's things, it's things like your work. You know, I used to easily put twelve or fourteen hours into a day of work, always striving for an image of myself as a perfect worker or you know perfection in the task that I was performing. Um, whereas now, you know, I just leave at the end of the end of my natural working day, which is hopefully around eight hours. Um, and work is as as it is when I leave it, and when I come back the next day, it's as I left it the day before. Um, something else that I felt, you know, fits in with the idea of losing is um, linear progress. So you know, it's quite a common idea that you're climbing some sort of spiritual ladder, making progress along a certain track and that progress is tested by your understanding. So you, you'll find that you know, Buddhism is full of lists 
of um, progress. You know, you've stepped along the way to enlightenment and those sorts of ideas. So, um, feeling like that wasn't a destination for me, a valid, a valid um, outcome. You know, it was really important in, in terms of opening up my practice to just just being about what what naturally is. Um, so I'm just going to skip ahead a bit because I wrote quite a wrote quite a long talk actually. So um, and I realised we're already up to 15 minutes, so wouldn't don't want to take up too much of your time tonight. So um, <clears throat> yeah. So let's thinking about so with the going back to that term sort of greed, hatred, and ignorance. Um, in terms of practice, so it's been a long time trying to squeeze them out, or try, you know trying to crush them um, rather than trying to understand them in their natural states and that's just that that sort of idea of just observing things as they are whether you're in meditation or walking around or doing something else um, so you know, with saved like uh, with greed and generosity you know I didn't find it a very useful practice for me to um, to try to replace greed with generosity. So I felt that generosity on its own doesn't remove greed from your heart. But I felt that understanding uh, like the natural state purpose of greed enabled me to lose that um, reactive tendency towards actions you could classify as sort of um, greed motivated. And of course, like greed, it doesn't have to be for an extreme, just the, just those little clutching, clinging parts of you that sometimes tries to put yourself first. Um, I just want to pull a couple of things out um, from um, traditional Buddhist teachings. Because um, I just I think of them as a the whole lot as a sort of a panoply, a big storehouse of skillful means. Uh, for us to choose from and in terms of the um, practices that enable you to lose or let go there's quite a lot of material to go on um, one of the sort of older ideas is the like the four body sat the vows um, you know there's sentient beings are numberless are about to save them and and so on um, but those are you know, the they're often called like impossible vows because you can't really ever, you know, you can't ever hope to attain what the what the goals are for those things. But that's, you know, again, that's what I felt like is an idea in there about losing because you're, although you can never attain those goals, you're continuously striving towards the void, striving. Um, you know, just you know, your intention is towards those outcomes. Um, So I came up, I was just, I've just finished reading a book um, by, oh, what's it called, From It's When Breath Becomes Air by Paul Kalanathiti. He's a, um, it's a quote I just want to share with you about, which kind of I feel a little bit like sums up my practice. So um, he was a, the author was a neurosurgeon that developed um, lung cancer and um, started writing a book towards the end of um, his battle with cancer. Um, and so this is just a quote from that. I woke up in pain facing another day. No project beyond breakfast seems tenable. I can't go on, I thought. And immediately it's Antiphon responded, completing Samuel Beckett's seven words, words I had learned long ago as an undergraduate. I'll go on. I got out of bed and took a step forward, repeating the phrase over and over. I can't go on. I'll go on. And so even though, even though that come from a sort of a different context, that idea of I can't go on, I'll go on, just, re just resonated with me. Um, just, in, just in many ways, but certainly in regards to my practice. Um, I don't know, I want to just 
you know, because we're up to we're up to twenty minutes. I'd like I don't like hogging the conversation. So is, is there anything anyone would like to like to say? Anybody has a question? I suggest you just walk up to them. kneel in front of the computer and put it to. I can uh, I can hear you quite well. Good. Shy tonight? No, I'm not sure you know. That's all. I've got actually. I've got a. Well, I've got a point. So while people are thinking, while people are thinking or flicking their eyelids to stay awake, listening to me. Um, this is about secular Buddhism. Actually, I was listening to a talk by someone the other day on a podcast, and um. There was a guy, Tigan Dan Layton, I think, um, from the, sort of the Austin Zen Center, something like that. Um, and he was talking about the development of um, Buddhism around the world. And he talked about how in most countries, as, it, as Buddhism spread, you would find one form of Buddhism in each country. Um, and he said, you know, but in, in um, America, as Buddhism developed, all of the different forms of Buddhism pretty much have gone to America and created this, you know, big, really big open culture um, where there's a lot of communication between the different forms of Buddhism. Um, so he was, he was just talking about that in terms of the development of, of Buddhist ideas and um, it made me just sort of reflect on that, well, that's kind of for me that's that's where a sort of secular buddhism has come from is from the engagement of of all those different um people trying to find the common ground i don't know if that so are you a secular buddhist um well, that depends on your definition. <laughs> I could say I'm a secular Buddhist in terms of how I perceive it, but that may not be the same as how you see it. But in if, you know, if if, I, if that, by that you mean you know, I want my practice to be modern. I want it to help me to engage meaningfully with the world as it is now, rather than replicate um, some kind of monastic ascetic ideal from a thousand or more years ago. Definitely, I think we've got a, we've got a lot on our plate as a as a society, as a as a planet, and we need to be yeah we need to be using you know so I'll use the term faith or you know faith religion practice. We need to be using that positively and um, and engaging like in yeah like um, political systems. I mean I don't know, I don't know what you guys follow. I find you I follow. Um, Twitter. I'm not a Facebook fan, but I, I'll look at Twitter and I see a lot more Buddhist teachers in America speaking out, especially as a consequence of Donald Trump um, speaking out against all sorts of things. And that's probably not something that Buddhism is well known for historically. So I mean, there's that, you know, so I find, yeah, in terms of the secular, secular practice, I find that encouraging even with the more traditionalist. Any other questions, please? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not really Buddhist, but I'll, I'll just, uh, can you hear me? I'm not really Buddhist, but I'll, what? <laughs> I'll say, you can't see me. But it's a man. Um, I'm not really Buddhist, but um, I do have one question about losing. Um, I was just thinking about it when you were talking. Um, I've been meditating for a while and I kind of realized that um, after a while that I'd been just chasing good feelings of meditation, you know, the feeling of getting relaxed or letting go of this or, or a bit more aware and so on. And it was kind of annoying because I realized that um, I hadn't really been meditating. I'd just been chasing these little fantasies, you know. Um, and that, was, that, was, that was quite useful because when I really thought about it, um, well, they let, maybe, maybe not let all of that go, but just a bit of it go. <laughs> I mean, do you find that sort, of, that sort of thing as well, or I'm just curious? Yeah, I suppose. Um, 
I mean, one of the things I was, I was when I was just thinking about talking earlier, um, but you know, in some ways, there's nothing wrong with you know, if you for your practice, if you want to, yes, yeah, say be, I you know, want to be more calm or more relaxed. This is what I want my meditation to provide or do for me. There's um, there's nothing sort of inherently wrong with that in my mind. But um, for me, in terms of sort of losing, what I found um, was that sometimes I was I was actually becoming more stressed out by trying to create um, calmness in myself. You know, if you're thinking if there's um, you know a lot, I just want to sit down for half an hour and meditate nice and peacefully and quiet in the peace and quiet. And, and then the neighbor's dog starts barking or, um, you know, someone pulls up a truck outside and they're revving the engine and bashing the horn because someone might get out of the way. Um, so I found, yeah, you know, I found that, that it can, it, having the goal of being calm in, in my practice, it's in, it sometimes made things, made it harder to be calm. But when I so when I was kind of investigated what was going on, going on for me at those kinds of times, I found it's what I really wanted to get rid of. In actual fact, was um, was the of the actual obstacles to calmness, or or to really, you know having a relaxed state of mind. So it wasn't trying to cultivate it; it was to try and find what was um, making me less calm at other times. So that, you know, so they removed the obstacles, so that the, you know the calmness arose naturally. Another question, please. Have some time. Liam, don't say hello. Hi, Liam. Right <laughs> <laughs> I'm Damon. Hey, um, I've got a similar question, actually. Um, so I've been meditating for about four or five months and I'm really sort of struggling with the idea of letting go of these negative emotions. So I'm sort of wondering um, how long it sort of took you um, and how, how did you get there sort of thing? Was it just through regular practice or, you know, I'm just sort of wondering how to get there sort of thing. Um, well, you're in a group. You're in a in amongst a group there. But I'll, I'll ask you a sort of a personal question. You don't have to answer it. But what is why is it that you're finding letting go of the negative emotions difficult? Um, I'm not too sure. But what you said about ideals earlier really resonated with me as well. Um, I've got these sort of ideals and stuff. These values that have built up over time and it's trying to break them down and sort of let go of those that I'm struggling with. Um, yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, I would say like, um, words of encouragement, really, if you're having, if you're having that kind of stuff come up, um, especially early on in your practice, if you've been doing this for, for months rather than years, uh, say that's actually a sign of good progress. It's like quite a fertile ground, yeah. um, you know, for what's going to come next. You know, I, I think that was, you know, when I first started in, with meditation, it was back in the days when um, there's that big explosion in self-help techniques and self-help books and, um, just do this and you will be happy you know it was um it was that there's a lot of that around and i found that meditation seemed to make me quite um unhappy at times um but when you persist with the practice of course you know there's limits there is limits to that um you know if it's you know if it's um harming your mental health then of course it's, it's you know you need to stop for a while and do something different but um but part of that mental anguish, you know, that's, you know, that's kind of what the whole, you know, well, for me, you know, if I think of myself as a Buddhist, that experience in that mental anguish, and especially during meditation, that's a lot of what it's about. That's where you find, find you like your true self, if you like, and, and um, 
come to know what you know what kind of lies under the surface yeah yeah okay cool thanks so, yeah that just lets me know that that i have been making progress because you know sometimes it's quite hard to see your own progress as well um but there's different and there's different ways to look at things too isn't there there's you know there's some um, you know that's why i quite like reading books by different authors because they've got different ideas about how to crack the same nut yeah. um you know and so, and sometimes it's good to do that those hard those hard yards and then other times it's good to to just leave that to one side and try a different kind of practice as well right okay. thank you Questions in the background? Okay. Oh, we have a question. No good one. Oh. <laughs> then let's have your bad question now. That's fine. <laughs> good question. Bad question. <laughs> as far as bad questions go, um, how we, we kind of talk about kind of talked about you know it not being so much well there's there's buddhism there's the these the practices a lot of practices that just kind of carried along for for a thousand years thousands of years at this point um that we don't necessarily kind of want to hold on to um and then others that we do um much value do you, do you see much value in holding on to the label of, of Buddhism? Um, do you feel like it's a good label or kind of the, the general outlook of, of what we call secular Buddhism or or do you just thought maybe there's some baggage there? Yeah. That's a good it's a good question. There's a lot of um a lot of people debating it too. Um, again, I, I, I'm listening to somebody talk recently about the development um, of Buddhist ideas around the world, and it kind of struck me how, um, you know, like they were making the point that Buddhism's been in the West as such for, um, well, like successfully since the late 50s in America and it sort of it sort of took off a lot more in the 60s and 70s so we haven't really kind of had it for that long in a way and we're already moving on so you know after sort of the yeah like you know the progress the changes in the ideas um, and the development of new schools of um, Buddhism being measured in hundreds of years rather than um, decades you know, we've now come to a point which we're quite used to in other areas um, of our sort of society, that things change much more rapidly. You know, and I think that's, to me, that's where there's that, where there, there is that tension between how, you know, how we do business as a society and, and how these, um, how we, you know, come up against these ideas of traditionalism and pres preservation of things which sometimes on the on the face of it don't make a lot of sense um, but I do think we need to create our own um, not sort of discard everything but you know Buddhism is well known for taking on the cultural inflections of the countries it moves to and so and so things so you know, so as an example, you you know, um, like I say, I love listening to podcasts and things. So people will talk about the koans and other famous stories from Buddhism, and and you know, you listen to it or you read it, and it makes absolutely no sense. And then when someone explains it in the cultural context of that country, even down to what um, colours might signify. So when you mention a blue dragon, that to me that just means a blue dragon, but in, in some cultures that has a, the, you know, the blue signifies a certain type of dragon which represents and that Unstable connections. 
He'll come back in a second. The blue dragon has frozen. <laughs> <laughs> I what that means, whether that's our end or his end. We're not meant to find out about the blue dragon. Yeah. I don't know, can Raji still hear us? Raj, can you hear us? Yeah. 